All right, welcome to Doozer Shop. Uh, it's Sunday. I've been working all day today and all day yesterday in the shop. Um, got some trying to get some stuff accomplished. Um, so I was real happy with the last video with uh, my power feed for the Colchester lathe, all my final stuff that uh, that went into that, on and then the. Uh, the, the the actual last one was the uh, the threading dial, so real happy with that threading dial. Also, I'm getting my videos mixed up. But yeah, the last the, the very last video was the threading dial. Both of those uh, things projects turned out great. The, the 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 power feed fix and the threading dial, awesome. So I'm I'm in front of the Rockford planer. Um, it's a it's a great backdrop for a video. Uh, I've been working on it. I've been working on the Rockford planer. Um, this thing sat in my friend Jim's uh, uh, garage barn. I guess you call it a barn. I think twenty years, maybe fifteen. No, it, it was twenty for sure. Anyways, so you you seen some video a ways back when I I went and got this up in. Uh, Buffalo, New York. But anyways, I, I, I think I have a project for <laughs> this Rockford planer. And I'll get into that, but in anticipation of the project. So, I started cleaning this before. You can see this is clean. Maybe you can see the other side. It's kind of mungy. Um, I did start cleaning this. Um, so, and I, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll just take a handheld. I'm, I'm show, I'll show you why I think I need to get this planer going sooner than later. Um, I need to change oil. It takes 30 gallons of oil. Um, I got to get a pump and pump it out to a drum and whatever. But let me go handheld and let me show you the next uh, thing I got into with fixing up the Colchester 17 inch lathe. So let me grab the camera, let me take you over to the Colchester, and let's begin at the beginning. All right. All right, so what you may notice new I have installed the gap. Yay! All right, so I installed the gap. And the keen-eyed observers will notice a dial indicator. And this is not Alice's restaurant. This is Doozer's dial indicator. So we ran into a little problem with the gap. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's funny. It looks beat up, but it's actually scraping. So this lathe is a hardened bed. Okay. Um, and I've always said it's in fine condition, and, and it re really is. But I ran into an issue with the gap. So the gap is held in by these two Allen head bolts. And actually there's some, some other bolts you, you can bolt that the gap actually tight shut. Um, but either way. So I fit the gap, okay? So I had the, the lathe surfaces I uh, I stoned them down with an India stone, and I stoned underneath the the gap, you know, with an India stone, knock off all the high spots. And I think what is going on here is the gap is high. The gap is high by like a thou and a half in the back. It it comes from the original lathe bed and humps up the gap by like a thou and a half. And in the front, if you measure it, it, it humps up about two and three quarter thou. So I've been using my dial ind indicator to measure. If I measure from, okay, so, so just so you guys know, these are inverted V ways, and they're like 90 degree ways, 45 down each side of the triangle. So,
if you measure with the indicator 90 degrees tangent to this bed and it humps up here the 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 hump from here to here is four thou the hump from the back up to there is four thou sorry I'm in the shadow so the bed is kind of smooth and the scraping marks have been apparently worn off of it over the years and the gap still has scraping marks on it okay so what I think happened is somebody ran this lathe for many years without the gap installed. In the bed war, the gap did. So I thought of different options. Where it seats on the bed, you know, one, one way is to, to mill that down or grind that down, but then it's not going to work because you have to lower the front straight down two and three quarter thousandths almost three thousandths and you gotta lower the back down um, one and a half thousandths almost two thousandths so you can't just grind the bottom or mill the bottom so you gotta you gotta mill off the flat surface and the uh, the prismatic way, the inverted V way. But it'd be nice to grind them because the bed is hard and the gap is hard. So, how do I go about doing that? Well, let me sidebar. So, the, so, so this is a little different, this lathe. Usually, you have for the carriage, it rides. And then the carriage meaning the carriage rides on a V-way and a flat way, which this one does. And then the tailstock rides on a, a V-way and a flat way, but typically the tailstock has the V-way in the back and the flat way in the front. So it would be V flat, V flat. But this lathe is switched around. It doesn't matter. It's just an interesting note how they did that. Okay. So I'm I'm, fa I'm faced with and I can't leave it because it, it's gonna it jumps up and it's kinda screwy Louie. But you know with the indicator, so let me show you. So, so what I got so there's a V block and this is just it's just a square bar. If I go, well, I'm not going to do it. Screw it. But uh, basically, if I put the indicator if I put the indicator on this V block, it, 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 it traverses that oops hear it? It jumps up almost 3 thou. So that's how I know it's like 2.75 thou. So the measurement of where coming straight in the side is 4 thou, straight in the other side is 4 thou, and if you multiply by the square root of 45, 7.707, it gives you like 2.8, which is exactly what, you know, the indicator reads either on the uh, you know if I indicate the top okay so there's a flat on top so this flat is dead nuts there is no transition if I have the indicator riding on the lathe bed and I transition over that little pump the, the crack there to the gap that needle stays on zero it blips a little and it stays on zero so that's how I know the gap is installed properly I mean the top of the way is is zero 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 so I know this this is installed properly so as I said 
as evidenced by the scraping on the gap and no scraping on the bed, I think I gotta fit the gap. So it's easy because, so this gap is nine inches in length. Nine inches, okay? So that's kind of important if you're gonna try to surface grind it or how big is your machine that you're gonna machine it on. So it's easy to flat grind something, cake, right? Totally freaking easy. To grind something at an angle of 45 degrees, it's, you have to set it up, it's a challenge. So, how do I do this? How do I grind four thou off here four thou off here and I guess it's a little bit easier just a flat surface grind a thou and a half or whatever it needs off the back so that's my task that I'm faced with that's the next step of getting this lathe running going usable okay so yeah after the disappointment set in I thought I could just put the gap in and paint it and use it and blah 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 Nope. Nope, when you're blessed with the burden of the intelligence to be able to do this stuff, for some reason you get these tasks laid in front of you. But I'm not complaining because I paid like, I think 1500 bucks for this lathe. It was a pretty good deal. So I'm willing to put up with a little, you know, fiddle, fiddle farting around. Okay. So there's milling and there's grinding. Grinding's better. So my only working grinder, I do have an Okamoto out in the high bay, but it needs restoration. Hydraulics are kind of daft up and it's filthy. The only grinder I have um, is the Boyer Schultze. And that's a 6 by 12 inch. And will it go high enough? I think so. But I'm fighting a lot of things. That gap weighs like 50 pounds. I didn't weigh it, but I know what 50 pounds feels like, and it's heavy. It could be 60 pounds. No, it's about 50. Either way. So, if I put 55 pounds on that magnet, could I still crank the table? Hmm. We've got a huge uh, Chevalier grinder at work. It's like 12 inch by 36 inch. So I could take it to work and grind it. So the angle, how do I grind the angle? Well, I could dress the wheel at an angle, but and, and at 45 degrees or exactly what I got there. Um, but then you're creep feeding, kind of. I mean, not, not really. Well, your side, you got a lot of surface area. I don't know how that would work. So this is where you guys, if you've got experience in, in different machining aspects, tell me what you think. What if I set that gap, maybe not necessarily on this grinder, but a little bit bigger surface grinder, and dress the wheel at 45 degrees, and ground four thou off each side of that gap. I just don't know. I wonder what the way grinder folks do that do lathe beds. I don't know. So think about that. Or we could put a, an adjustable angle plate on here. I might have to unbolt the, the, the magnetic chuck to put an angle plate on here and tip the gap at an angle. But then again, 50 some pounds plus an angle plate is going to be too much weight for this baby surface grinder. It's just, that's my thoughts. Anyways, let me go back here. So, let me show you, this is a Starrett X block, it's, it's a V block. So, to eliminate any anomaly from the wear end, okay, the tailstock end should have no wear. So, let me show you, I put that on there, it has a little bit of rock. Let me kneel down. And you're probably not going to be able to see the rock. Let 
You get me kind of. See that? Over, back. See that? So this X block or V block or whatever you call it. It's a little rock, right? So this might not be 90 degrees. It might be like 89 and a half. I mean, it is like a piece of paper's with a rock. But, you know, I found that out when I was making the, the way wiper parts. I mean, it's close, but either way, you'd have to indicate you know, your setup. Okay, um, let me take it back around. I can't mill it on the SIP. I'm, the top speed's 300 RPM. And if I use the carbide end mill, the, I'd have to angle the gap and the top speed is 300 RPM. All right, so I was thinking, why not have a bridge port and use a carbide end mill in a bridge port, even though grinding is better. Um, I've never put my bridge port together. I have a headless bridge port. The table's just a, ta <laughs> a table. I've got the head for it in the attic of my house, and I rebuilt the head, but uh, let me kind of back up, walk around. So this is my headless bridge port. Um, I took the ram apart and, and the turret and everything, so that's all clean and everything. But I never got to the base, okay? And the ways are just got surface rust on them. I don't know the condition. Well, all right. It's got chrome ways, but it's got a little bit of scratchiness in there. I don't know the condition of this, and I don't know how accurate it is. But, I mean, obviously you could tip the head on a bridge port 45 degrees down or 45 degrees up. That's a possibility. Um, the Gordon is a rigid ram. Okay, the Gordon, the head cannot tip. So you need a fixture plate on the table to tip the gap at an angle and present that to a carbide end mill. And the Gordon it spins way fast enough. I think it's like up to 4,000 RPM. Skookum as frig. Anyways, um, yeah, it's nice because, I mean, Bridgeport, uh, you know, I could, I could get the Bridgeport back together, but that means taking it apart and scrutinizing the ways, cleaning them, getting the Bijour lubrication system working. But it's nice because I could bolt the gap to the ways. And I'm thinking I would take cuts with a quarter inch carbide end mill to minimize the amount of tool pressure. I don't know. Think about that. Give me your comments with that. Okay. Um, same thing. The Van Norman. Uh, 1,100 RPM. Okay, so maybe. But I have not. I've cleaned up the Y axis and redid the gib on there, but the rest of it's filthy. Oh my gosh, it's just fung mong chung. And that I could set at a 45 degree angle. The old uh, horizontal to vertical head, the old Vandy Norman. Okay, and then I would not need a fixture plate. Okay, so let's go over. <sighs> okay, um. Uh, yes, let's go over to the Rockford hydraulic open side planer. Oh yes, Doozer has an FP1 deckle, and I do have the angle table. This is actually usable. I could plug this in and, 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 and use it. Hmm. 
and run a carbide end mill in the decal. This thing, the ways are all clean, this thing's ready to go. Either way. Alright, so. The Rockford. How close is the Rockford to being usable? Well, aside from changing the oil and doing some cleanup, I could probably use it. So I'll show you what I've been doing. I've been cleaning up. It's always a, a trip hazard walking around the shop with the camera. Oh, so anyways, my dad found uh, for like three or four bucks this Craftsman wrench at a garage sale. Inch and a sixteenth and inch and a quarter. So the inch and a sixteenth fits the lock, the lock bolts there and there. And there's one like behind somewhere but and it also fits those are inch and a sixteenth those are inch and a sixteenth those are inch and a sixteenth these are inch and a quarter so how good is that so so like a, a three four five dollar wrench I asked my dad I said hey can I have that wrench he's like yeah okay sure so there we go so I got a wrench for the uh, the Rockford okay I know my, my bands everything okay this is not as bad and dirty as... So, the light makes these look kind of bad. So, you can see the scraping, like a... Scraping on the edge. So, there's like a lake a brown rust. So I scraped all this with a razor blade and then I stoned it with an India flat stone. So this one too um, and I, I, I've used a, a razor blade and I'm going to pull the way wipers, but I got up to the way wipers there. And I got up to the way wipers there. But, you know, it looks bad, but it ain't. This, this, it's just like, I don't know, it's like hard flat rust. I'm trying to keep the glare from the light. Yeah, this is flat, and I've stoned this for like, 15 minutes rubbing it with uh, my India stone uh, using paint thinner for lubricant. Let me get close to it. Oh, so here's my razor blade. It's just like a windshield sticker scraper and I hone that sharp as a razor. Well, it is a razor. I hone it sharp. So anyways, um, like I said, these look worse on camera than they are. Um, you can hardly feel that. You just can't. But anyways, the ways in this thing are in really good shape. They just are. It looks funky on camera. But I assure you, that this is flat and that this is hard, tight, rust from, I don't know, I, don't, I have no idea, but it, I mean you can't measure that, that. It, it, it is just flat and smooth, like you feel no difference. I'm almost sorry to show this on camera because people are going to say, oh my god, that's horrible. Well, I don't know what to do about it. It's flat and you're going to say, oh look at these scratch marks and striations. You cannot feel that with your fingernail. You cannot feel it with your fingernail. It's just so minute, but it looks bad because I stoned it, right? I stoned it flat. Um, yeah, so I am not worried about that in the least. I think this thing is in freaking awesome condition. It really is. So anyways, okay, so 
um, be interesting to stick the camera in there. That's where the oil goes. I got the, the cover off. And the oil level is like two inches below that opening. And I'm going to drain the oil. I'm going to suck the oil out because that gasket's leaking. See, I put some sawdust there. That gasket on the big cover is just, you know, maybe, I don't know, not even a drip a day. I mean, it's maybe two drips a week. It's not much, but it, it'll accumulate. So once I drain the oil out, I'm going to uh, pull that cover and regasket it, and I'm going to suck the um, scoop the schmung out the bottom. Um, anyways, so so yeah, okay. So I want to put a light under here. Wouldn't that be cool? I've got handhole openings. And these ways are in fine shape. The vertical adjustment ways. So you get that rust in there, and it and, and then you stone it off with an India stone. And it's like embedded in the flaking, um, the rust. But I assure you, that's as smooth as can be. That's just fabulous smooth. Like I said, that doesn't bother me. It's just the coloration of it. Um, so, yeah, not a problem. So, that's a 10 horse motor. I need to up my phase converter capacity. I got 6 horse now, I'm going to double it to, uh, to 12 by adding another six horse motor. Hey, there's my flashlight. Check this out. Um, this is my surface inspection plate. It's got a presence sensing light bulb. So when I get closer, watch the, the lamp. Come on, let's make a liar out of me. See, it came on. Just from uh, getting close to it. So I thought that was cool. I still have to switch on the, the side light, the lamps. Um, kind of cool. I've got a shaving mirror from Ikea, and it's got the magnifier, um, you know, for uh, in the regular one on the back side. So if you got something in your eye, um, it's really handy for that. Um, you know, it's, it's, just, it's a nice little addition to the inspection corner, I think. Yeah, this is such a cozy little corner. Oh, and I got my switch for the, the other, put that on, and then that that's for these two lamps. It's like a little switchy deal. Okay, so, um, yeah, this is what I was talking about. This is a little too small, but this is the idea, an adjustable angle plate. Um, this little bitty itty angle plate, I think it's made in China. Or no, I think it says Taiwan on it. It doesn't matter. Anyways, I got this. The guy that I bought the uh, Giddings and Lewis uh, horizontal boring mill, he threw it in as a freebie. Um, and I cleaned it up, and I, I, I think I don't, I don't know if I ground it or kissed it or what. But I took it apart, and I had to do some milling on it. See around there, it was rough cast, and I wanted to use the middle T-slot, so... But anyhow, long story short, an adjustable angle plate like this sure would be nice to, to mount that gap. It's not, this is obviously, it's like, this is like 5 by 7 or something, it's too small. So I was going to buy one, and they got one um, angle plates. See, this one will do 90 degrees. In any angle in between. They got ones that have like a curvic kind of uh, uh, mechanism that will go 45 degrees flat, 45 degrees flat, 45 degrees. And that's all I need is 45 degrees. So the thing is, you see them on, on the sale flyers, you know, like JL or MSC or Travers. But they're all, I, I, th I don't know if they're made in China or made in India. And I, I, I know on eBay they got some made in India. And I just, I'm hesitant to take a chance on, on, on one from India and, and, and China. But India especially. Not because I have anything against the country or the people or the government or anything. It's just that, you know... The rich executives that import this stuff and try to make a buck on it, they specify the cheapest 
specification for what they import and then they reap the profits but something like this I don't want to get on a political rant I got one oh, I got up there I think that's a regular that blue one's an angle 90 degree angle plate that doesn't help me these two things here are Taft Pierce angle magnets which are sweet mm, tooling plates Here's a, this doesn't help me, universal thing. But I don't have anything that'll work. I just don't. Um, a lot of cool stuff in this tooling cabinet. Oh, so, there you go. That's for the decal. But that doesn't help me, because it's 90, and I know it swivels. Mm, like, there's the vertical head for the decal. There's the vise for the decal. There's overarm for the decal that's some kind of indexing thing for the decal and it has another overarm I think I've got yeah there's two overarms there's that's an overarm and that's another overarm and one of them is for the indexing thingy and that's some kind of end mill sharpener but anyways um so a lot of rambling. Okay. So my question is, could I put a carbide tool bit with holder because that gap is hardened? I don't know how hard. I'm going to assume 50C. And could I take fourth thou by, by shaping it off with the planer? I have zero shaping experience. I have zero planer experience as of this point in my life right now. But I got this awesome Rockford planer. But, you know, if I mount it to the table and, you know, I could set this compounded 45 hell I wonder if I could set that one at 45 no that'd be a pain in the ass I don't know but anyways could I learn how to leave a beautiful surface finish and take off four thousandths without screwing it up I don't think so but maybe I could I don't know I don't want to try I could bolt a grinding head up to this and grind the son of a gun, right? Okay? Yeah, so that comes off. Sorry. That, the clapper box comes off and I could put on a grinding head. So, what would I, what kind of grinding spindle would I put on there? Do I have one? Well, maybe. And let me show you what I got. All right. Walk, don't trip. Don't trip on the vacuum. We're going over to the 13. We're going on walkabout. Loser shop. There is the Covell. The Boyer Schultz. Okay, the Brown and Sharp. 13. So obviously this is a cylindrical grinder. And all the goodies that a cylindrical grinder has. But, here's the wheel. This spindle cartridge bolts on with four bolts, okay? And I could use this spindle cartridge and bolt it to a plate and, and mount it to the, the, uh, the Rockford hydraulic open side planer. But wait, there's more. I happen to have like four spare Brown and Sharp 13 spindles. I got three more that are ball bearing. I've got one more that's a uh, uh, plain bearing, oiled bushing type spindle. So that's an idea. And of course, yes, I would cover the ways that goes without saying from the grit. Ooh, I can even use the guard off of this. Look at that. And it's got a vacuum chute. Oh, look at that. 
so this wouldn't be that hard, okay? So that's like about a foot or so between the bolts. And I, I need to rig up a pulley and a motor, but hell, that's that's easy, right? I mean, that's cake. That's that's a pulley. So yeah, I'm liking it. So that wouldn't be too awful difficult. Uh, the gap of doom. All right, so that's an idea. So you folks uh, ruminate on that for me a little bit. So one of my subscribers, uh, Jim, Jim C, he said, hey, Doozer, you know what you could do? So I don't have dowel pins in this. It, you just put the bolts in and, and you line it up. There's a dowel pin hole there. I don't know, there's one somewhere, I don't know, on the front. But anyways, what you can do is he said, um, loosen your bolts and float it so this edge of the V-way is lined up. And then instead of this being sticking out four thousandths, it might be sticking off eight thousandths. And they said, just grind or mill the one V-way eight thousandths and forget about the other one. Call this back one good. And technically that, that's not a bad idea. Because there's no reason to have the tailstock way. The tailstock does not, I mean, there's the nose of the chuck, and when you put the chuck on, it's like here. Um, there's, I've never seen a gap for a gap bed lathe that had the tailstock ways in the gap. So you're not going to use this anyway. So, so what he said about, you know, and it will, it'll offset, you know, 20,000. So if I line this one up and just ground or mill this one, that's an idea. So you folks, if you want to write a comment, let me know what you think about that idea. Okay, enough of that. So let me go around the back because I've been doing other stuff. Let me sit down. All right. So what this is, this is the motor that I installed on the Colchester lathe. And yes, it's taken apart a little bit. So this backing plate, I cleaned up the backing plate and I painted, painted it and I installed it. It's got a little shelf there with some jack screws and and everything. So, so it, it's got slots in it and these are like T-bolts so you can adjust it for height. So that's cool. And uh, ooh, how neat is that? So I got the motor on but I took the motor apart. Oh dear. You may ask why. Well, the reason why is this. Um, Brooks Compton Motor. Um, all right, so. There's the wires coming out the bottom, okay? And there they go up in to the bottom. I hope that light, you know, it's not doing it justice. Either way. So these these wires go up in the bottom. Okay. There's a hole there. And this rubber sheet was there, you know. But you can see the the wiring box was off. This is not a bad shot. The wiring box was off and the wires are just hanging. Okay. And I had it on my cart and a mouse got up inside the motor. Because I noticed when I, when I was fumbling around trying to clean the wires, I was trying to wipe them down with lacquer thinner. 
a little piece of blue shop towel came out, paper towel. And then I stuck my finger up in there and more ripped up pieces of blue shop towel came out and a piece of like furniture foam came out and I'm like, oh shit. A mouse had been up inside the motor. What the hell? So I said, man, I should pull the end bells of the motor to, uh, to make sure I, I vacuum out the mouse nests and there's no mouse pee, which is corrosive. Yeah, I was upset. So anyways, um, what I did was, uh, was this. So, this bell with the fan was the one that, that goes on this side. In the end with the pulley, so there's the bearing, and there's the shaft, and there's the pulley. That obviously, hopefully obviously, it stuck out this side. And see those brake shoes? That's where the pulley for the uh, input to the headstock goes. So a pulley goes there. And the pulley obviously is on the motor shaft. So I had to take off the end bell where the pulley was on the pulley side. And the reason was that the end bell on the back side, it had um, like four screws around it, so the thrust for the bearings, the axial thrust was, re the bearings were re retained by this end bell. So I couldn't pull this end bell off because there were screws going into the bearing um, keeper and I couldn't take it out this side. So I was forced to remove the pulley and take off the pulley so I could get this side off. Now, this pulley, it was seized on there. Can you see the red fretting, corrosion, rust? You can see in the camera, it's very red. So fretting corrosion happens when there's movement relative between two parts. And steel is self-passivating, just like copper turns green and stops corroding. Steel doesn't do it to that extent, but it is self-passivating. So when steel rusts, um, it, it stops rusting any further or at least slows down a good bit. That's what black oxide is um, or bluing or browning. It's, it's a rust layer and it's not like iron oxide. It's like iron trioxide or something. I'm not a chemist. But anyways, um, what, what causes fretting is steel parts get rubbed together and they get a shiny spot and it rubs the, the, the protective layer off. And then they rust again. And then they get rubbed again. And then they rust again. And then they rub together again and it wears off that protective layer again. And they rust again. And they rust from the humidity in the air. But if it rubs and rusts, rubs and rusts, Rust is something like, and I don't know the number exactly, but it's like 20 times greater volume than the base steel. So that's why it seizes on from fretting corrosion. It's that really ruddy rud red is, is, you can always tell. So this pulley was a bear to get off. It took me two and a half hours with the cutting torch as a heat source to get this pulley off. And you'll notice 
the marks from the gear puller there, there, and there. I was pulling on this thing. I was tightening the gear puller with a 18 inch crescent wrench and, it, and it, what I had to do is I was using the, I, 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 I didn't have a rosebud and I think I could have borrowed a rosebud. I think it was best I used the cutting tip because I, I put the, the tip in between the shivs because uh, you can very easily overheat the edge and melt them melt these little sharp edges of the shiv. So I, I had this thing glowing red um, and then as I had tension on the puller it would creak as I had the torch on it go snap, snap, snap where the tension you know it was it had broken the, 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 the grip of the rust and it, it lurched forward you know five thousandths, ten thousandths But I had been alternating. I would heat for like, once it was hot, I'd heat for about two minutes to get it cherry red, just, just a dull red, a dull, dull red, because that's all I could get out of it with the heat, the, the tip I had and the acetylene I had. Um, I must have done 20 heat cycles on this thing. 20 times of, you know, getting this thing you know, glowing a, a dull red, shutting the torch off, tightening the gear puller, lighting the torch, heating it up again for another two or three minutes, shutting the torch off, tightening the gear puller, and this thing was so hot, it would light the acetylene without a striker. It, it was just so hot. This thing was cooking. I mean, it was cooking. So, um, I gotta clean it up. There's my three job puller. Um, yeah. Without this puller, I mean, this thing, I couldn't have done it. Th this thing is just awesome. Actually, it was all three of them down. But this, this is an Enerpack brand puller made in Spain and people think Enerpack they think hydraulic but this this is what I used and uh, I mean this thing if I didn't have this puller and it was maxed out and I mushroomed this wrench hex a little bit I was hitting it with a copper hammer but still it, it mushroomed a bit but uh, worth its weight in gold, folks. I only paid 20, 20 bucks for this thing at Surplus Center. So it's a two and a three jaw. I got it configured for three jaws. I had the two jaw, only the two jaws on it. But there ain't no way. I needed the three jaws to equalize the, the pulling force. Absolutely. So, anyways... Um, did the mouse attack the windings? Well, I don't know. So the windings go down there. You can kind of see the, the exit hole. And I got the mouse nest sucked out. There was a mouse nest in there. You can see clear through the other side. There you go. You can see through. There was a mouse nest in there, and I sucked it out. And you can kind of see how there's an opening in between the uh, the the coils in the outside case. So so that's good because it's fan cooled. Um, the windings have been, I mean it's got glyptol on it, and this thing has a lot of varnish in it. Let me show you. This is actually a, this is varnish that I've, I picked out of it. There is so much varnish in this, which is good. They, they, they coated it with varnish. Um, so, see these? 
uh, ties. It's like thread that ties. They're like shoelaces, right? This is, I mean, it's basically exactly a shoelace, flat shoelace that ties the wire together. That's just grease, um, shiny grease. Let me show you where the mouse got it. <laughs> All right. The mouse ate some of the shoelace. You can see the varnish. He ate that shoelace. He ate that shoelace, that shoelace, and he ate that shoelace. But that's not bare wire. That's varnish. Okay. Because this this was painted with Glyptol, and it was uh, uh, impregnated with varnish. So this is not shorted out at all. This this is in just wonderful condition. It just looks like it's it's bare wire, but it's not, okay? This is what the mouse did. You can see even better the wires exiting the bottom. And they don't go to this side, the wires I think go to the other side. There's some time no, these are not the wires, these are the uh the splices for the center of the Y. I think this is the Y or the delta. But this, these are the coil connections. Or they could be the wires and the wires just go through. I don't know. But, like I said, this is the place where the mouse chewed is. Now I'm going to get some Glyptol and paint this up real good. I'm gonna blow it out with compressed air. I vacuumed it out some. But that mouse got it. And while I'm at it, um, I'm gonna shrink tube. I'm gonna put shrink tube over these leads. Um, one or two of them, they're a little scraped up. I don't think the insulation's compromised, but I'd rather not. I, I'm going to take this opportunity to unhook all these connections and I'm going to number my wires and put good quality shrink tube. Not that cheap stuff. I've got some shrink tube that has like a hot melt glue inside. Yeah, hot melt glue inside. So I'll take that as an opportunity. So like these wires, I had labeled them, was it say seven, high, eight. I've labeled these wires where they go, you know, on the, uh, the drum switch so I could reconnect them. But now I'm gonna have to label this side so there's there's metal wire markers on the wires. So I'm gonna label th these side this side of the wires before I take them off the motor leads and and do my shrink tube deal. But anyways, that's kind of it. Um, the bracket turned out really well. I didn't paint the lathe um, behind it, but so what. I can still get at it. I am so tired. I, like I said, that pulley up there, two hours. No, two and a half hours. Because I didn't want to let the pulley cool in between my sessions of wrenching and pulling and heating and wrenching and pulling and heating. Um, so this bearing, the grease turned into tar from the heat. I mean this stuff is like roof tar from the sun. I think the bearings are in okay shape. I think they're uh, 45 millimeter inside, 100 millimeter outside, and 25 millimeter thick. But uh, you know they're in, I think they're in okay shape. I've been beating on the puller 
with the copper hammer so they took some impact from that but I don't know I'm gonna see there's the fan so I'm gonna pull I'm gonna pull it pull all this off I'm gonna clean everything I'll take a trip over to the uh, um, parts washer I'm gonna trip over the vacuum all right, stuff on the bench, so everything becomes a bench. All right, so yeah, so there's the end bell. That's the pulley side end bell. You can just see the black tar that the, the grease turned into. I mean, it's a good grease when you heat it. Um, it just turned into tar, but that's fine. So anyways, that's what I've been working on. The mighty Colchester lathe. Don't trip over the tailstock for the Colchester lathe. Yep. That's my latest thing. I'm so tired today from the two hours plus of torching and wrenching and pulling. Um, I had a half a bottle left of uh, acetylene. I think it comes in at 200 PSI. I was down to 100, and now I'm down to 50. So this is my torch cart. It's cool, it's one of those inline torch carts. I got it all shut off now. But yeah, I'm down to 50. So, whatever. Might as well finish with a nice isometric shot of the Rockford planer. I'm tired. I'm going to go in, check my email, and go to bed. Until next time, this is Doozer Shop.